Jeff, I'm a podcaster and you're a podcaster. I feel like I want to say, wouldn't you like to be a podcaster too? Uh, but podcasting is something that's just exploding uh, around us. It's growing and growing and growing every year. Um, do you have any advice for anyone who would be interested in doing a pod bo doing a podcast that you could share? Or well, I'm a complete expert you've now learned. because I've done I've done 50 episodes. Of well, my podcast. that's a veteran. I read a stat somewhere that people start a podcast and like after three episodes, they're they're done. So well, you're a veteran. Yeah. Well. <laughs> A wily so veteran. <laughs> this is really frightening. I think, <laughs> I think, Chris, the, I would encourage people, there are conferences, there are books yeah. that are written about this. When you're thinking about getting into it, keep in mind that what you're doing is you're sort of bootstrapping something. You remember reading the, back in the day, the guerrilla marketing, mm -hmm. guerrilla marketing sure. for writers sure. or guerrilla marketing for whatever, because you, you start to realize that nobody is going to have an interest in getting your work out there like you do. Right. There's Absolutely. no white horse out there ready to be ridden into the castle and all you have to do is hop on. There's nothing like that. And, and the goal is not to reach everybody. We were just talking about this on our team a little bit earlier today. We really, we've, we have a niche audience, but we feel like we're really learning what our niche audience is. Mm -hmm. and we're not trying to reach everybody in the world. We're trying to reach this set of people. It's narrow casting, consistent. essentially. Narrow yeah. casting is the term, that, the was, term. That, yeah. was, that was used, yes. I learned something in college. So who is it that <laughs> wants to hear? Are they willing to give you honest feedback about it so you can improve? And then are they willing to tell their friends? Right. And are right. they willing to tell their friends to tell their friends? So it's very grassroots. I think it is grassroots. You know, the beauty yeah. of podcasting for a lot of people, you know, it's, it's incredible to me because several years ago, you remember when people were saying people's attention span is only eight seconds now yeah. or something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's crazy. It went, it went down from, oh, people could listen to an hour. They could watch an hour video. Then it went down to 20 minutes. And then they said seven or eight minutes. It's going back in the other direction. Joe Rogan shows oh, the most man. popular like podcast that long. there is. Three hours. Yeah. Three hours. So my children listen to that. That's how I knew they had an attention span more than 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the beauty of the podcasting format is that you can actually have a conversation with somebody. Mm. You can actually share things. Yeah. I, on my show, I like to have guests because a lot of my life I spend standing up in front of groups, telling them things. This is my chance to have other people sit with me Interact, and I can ask them organic. whatever questions I want. Right, right. We're really here today not to talk about podcasting, but I want to talk about cancel culture today. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you had asked me as recently as, you know, six or seven years ago and you used the term cancel culture, uh, I'd kind of look at you and kind of scratch my head and go, what what, what, what's that? And I'm a journalist. I'm generally a curious person trying to find out things, but... Yet, it seems we're hearing more and more and more about it each and every day. For the sake of our conversation today, how would you define cancel culture? Well, cancel culture started as a way to hold corporations responsible for irresponsible things that they did. So you might say to a company, well, Coca-Cola is a huge corporation, but if they do something that you don't like, you can say, I'm not going to drink Coca-Cola anymore. And so obviously, no, Coca-Cola doesn't care if you're if one person's not right. drinking their product right. anymore. So, huge. so they would you might try to use social media to get lots and lots of other people to agree with you, and maybe you can make a change. And it turns out enough companies made enough changes mm -hmm. that everyday people realize signing a petition or something like that can make a difference. Then it turned the corner. Hey, that person over there is delivering a message that we don't like. Let's sign a petition against them. Let's try to get them fired. Let's try to destroy their reputation. Mm -hmm. So cancel culture initially started out as, I'm canceling my subscription to your service because I don't like your message or you did something that offends me, to now canceling other people rather than having a dialogue yeah. in free speech you're canceling other people because you don't want their message to be heard right. by you or by anybody else. So what do you believe to be the root of cancel culture? Is this something that goes back to say the 1960s or is this something that's just in the 2000s that's come about? 
You know, I've always sort of suspected that there was a relationship between cancel culture and, and a Marxist worldview, not because cancelers are Marxists, but because, you know, Marxism wasn't just a set of ideas. It was an approach to society. And the Marxist approach was, we don't want to have dialogue with you. It, it, Marxist doesn't want to debate a capitalist. They want the capitalist to be shut down so that they don't, they don't get a chance to speak. Right. Because if yeah. you if you share the platform with them, you're by definition giving them legitimacy. That's how a Marxist would see it. So the social approach of that seemed to me to be the basis of it. And then I was reading a biography by Victor Sebastian uh, on Lenin. And I think there are more biographies of Lenin than any other person. That's really? why I mentioned, okay. uh, I mentioned the author. But in his biography, he talked about Lenin's approach to public speaking. Mm. And as I read it, you could just read it all on one page his nastiness toward people, the way he would use his language to dehumanize people and call them all kinds of nasty names, not just so that people would disagree with them, but so that they would hate them and want them to die. That, I realized, was the tie-in to what is the root of the cancel culture today. And that goes back you know, decades and decades and decades to go. Well, I mean, Karl Marx was that kind of a yeah, guy. Yeah, absolutely. And Karl Marx used the word abolish 33 times in the Communist Manifesto. That's he was all about canceling. Yeah, yeah. So, so why do you believe people of faith have seemingly become complacent and, I'm going to say the word, almost comfortable with the current climate of cancel culture? I mean, you would think we would be resistant as believers to it, but it just seems like people are like, oh, okay, I just wash over my head. Um, it seems like the cart, have become, people have become resigned to the cart driving the horse, so to speak. Your thoughts on that? Well, every time a cancel movement comes out, I think, it, I think it's sort of a sucker punch hmm. to, to everyday people. Like, I didn't realize that person was so evil. I, yeah. so, I, you know, I didn't realize they were that bad or now they're, if I associate with them, I'm going to be stuck to their ideology and I don't agree with their mm -hmm. ideology or the way they're being presented. So I think there's part of that. It's just a little bit like, you know, stay away from me. You're a leper sort of, sort of thing. But there, there are a couple of other things too. We don't like to be made fun of, right? It's I don't think part of a comfortable does. life is. Yeah that you get along with everybody, and if all of a sudden everybody's looking at you like you're you're bad or you're attached to something, it's it's super uncomfortable. My dog got skunked when he was a, oh, a yes. puppy. Get the tomato juice. Yeah, he tried <laughs> to bite the skunk in the, the rear end, so he uh -oh. got a shot full right Yeesh. in his mouth. And I had to go to the store to buy the stuff I could use to clean him up because the pet store was closed, it was like 11 o'clock at night. It was just not a very fun day. But as I was going through the checkout counter with all of my stuff, there were only two people working in the store, and one of them said, did you smell that? Like, did you smell that? The other one said, yeah, I think a skunk got in our store. <laughs> and I said, uh, that's, that's me. That's right? me. That's yeah. how people feel. If, you, if you're if you around somebody who is the object of derision of people, a lot of people, you don't want to be attached to that person because you know you might end up smelling like they smell. Yeah. That's something that people don't want. So the problem, Chris, is you, you hear something bad about somebody that you previously admired. What if it's true? Right. What if they really are a bad person? What if they really did abuse somebody else? If you defend them, then you've defended something that is bad. So it's better just to wait and see. That's kind of how people think of it. And in the process, so that gap that's there is where cancel cultures, culture kind of creeping cancelers in. Yes. get to do all of their work. Now, it's only, it's a very small percentage of the people. We've done a lot of polls, Chris, at Summit Ministries. And I want to talk about those in yeah. just a minute. Well, yeah. we found, for example, that only 5% of people in America say they respond to a conflict with another person by shutting them out of their lives. Mm. Only 5%. Mm. And yet the 5%, they're running the world right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to make sure I get these numbers right. Let's jump into this a little bit. A recent poll from your organization, Summit Ministries, and you teamed up with McLaughlin and Associates yes. on it. Uh, that survey or poll found that nearly 80% of voters believe that people who adhere to the values found in the Bible have the right to express their religious beliefs publicly. 
So where's the disconnect here? <laughs> right. Yeah, it, I couldn't believe that that figure. Yeah. And John McLaughlin is a great pollster, very, very credible. We didn't try to get into the polling business. That's not what we do yeah. at Summit Ministries. I mean, we're training and equipping a rising generation to embrace God's truth, to champion a biblical worldview. But we realized we needed more information about this cultural moment. Yeah, you need to know where you stand. Right. And, and the, the zeitgeist. Yeah, so right John now. helps yeah. us. We do, we do some of this polling. We asked several questions in that poll, but I was surprised Almost every American believes that people who have a religious viewpoint, even one you might disagree with, should have the right to express that yeah. viewpoint freely. Yeah. Okay, almost everybody. So who doesn't? Well, if you look at those poll results, 8% of the people basically say religious people should have no rights at all. Yeah. 8%, you know, the 5% yeah. cancelers. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're starting to see there's this very, very small tail that's wagging the whole dog in this mm. country. Mm. So in this same poll, 42% of Americans say they are hesitant to share their opinions on important cultural or political issues for fear of being, you know, for lack of a better term, being shunned. Um, so there's a lot of backlash there for them, for family, friends, and coworkers, for people to be, no, not going to do that. Um, what are some effective ways that we as believers can turn the tide, so to speak, and, and kind of turn the Titanic around so it doesn't overwhelm us. Well, Chris, I like to be liked. I don't we like it do. when people don't yeah. like me. I don't like thinking that I will lose something of my comfort if I take a stand. Mm -hmm. it, and that's it, exactly it's just, it. It gives yeah. me that momentary hesitation. I think we have to overcome that fear. Now, this last year, I went through cancer. Oh, sorry to hear I that. I didn't know. You don't know. Are you going to make it or not? No. The doctor said there's a very good chance of a cure if we do this very intense treatment. But I can tell you, once you're in it, and once you're around people all the time who might die because of cancer, your fear of death, your fear of being around people who are sick, your fear of sadness, all of those things, those fears start to go away because it's real. So we have to live in the reality of this moment. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is being willing to engage personally. I would say 98% or 99% of cancel culture happens at a distance. It's through social media. People yeah. will say something on Facebook that they would never say to that person face to face. Yeah. They're bully pulpit. They say so things to a stranger on Facebook that they would never say to a friend on Facebook. Mm. So it's that... It's that, that idea of, as a friend of mine puts it, can we have coffee and talk about this? If that becomes our impulse, then it starts to change. And keep in mind, we've known this for a long time. Albert Morabian back in the 1960s was a psychologist and he said 55% of our communication is through our posture and facial expressions. 38% of our communication is through our tone of voice. Only 7% is through our words. Mm. So when you send a nasty text to somebody, the 93% of your message is their interpretation of what you might mean. You only get to control 7% of it. So the more personal, the better. That's powerful, that's powerful. What are some of the motivations and faulty thinking behind our human desire to cancel other people? And, and I'll say, I'm gonna say it, our desire to think we can play God sometimes. I mean, what are some of those motivations? I think power is part of it. I, yeah. I think a lot of people feel like they've gotten pushed around in the past and they don't like feeling pushed around. And through social media, they don't get to be pushed around anymore, right? Their yeah. voice is just as yeah. powerful. If they can stay up till two o'clock in the morning sending out more nasty notes than somebody can in response, then they win. So a lot of times the cancel culture is driven by people who have felt themselves to be victims. Mm. And very often people who are victims out of a desire for revenge, become the meanest yeah. people. Yeah. It's, it's sad. Uh, from a Christian worldview, we would focus instead on the reality of sin, the desire for redemption, mm -hmm. forgiving one another their trespasses. Jesus said, don't just forgive somebody seven times, forgive them 70 times seven. But number 491, <laughs> the 491st right. time, right. watch out. That's right. Then you can... And yeah, then you yeah. can go after him. <laughs> yeah. Um, with that said, I mean, what types of things is your ministry, Summit Ministries, to what are you doing to stand in the gap 
so to speak, in the area of cancel culture? Well, we've got to start with the truth. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of people now say that truth is up to the individual rather than truth is real and can be discovered. Mm -hmm. I think that is the core battle of our day. I don't think the core battle is Republicans versus Democrats or conservatives right. versus right. liberals. I think it is the idea that there is such a thing as truth versus the idea that truth is up to the individual. So at Summit Ministries, students will come for two weeks at a time. They're 16 to 22 years of okay, age. Okay, I was gonna ask the age Most range. of yeah. them are preparing for college. That's kind of our target audience. So this is Gen Z we're talking about. Yes. Is it Generation Z? Yeah, Generation yeah, yeah. Z. We're in the middle of Gen Z right now. So yes. 12 years old to 25. Yes. My son that's is in that the, group. Right, that's yeah. what, well, and, you know, and a generation doesn't end in a day. Or oh, I end know. In a day, I but, know. But there is a big difference between the cultural experience of people who are 12 to 25 and, say, the cultural experience of people who are 40 to 60. Mm -hmm. I don't want to tell you exactly where I am in. I'm in that bracket somewhere. Good, we're in the bracket. And we're in yeah, it together. So. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but this very different cultural experience, they need to realize there is such a thing as truth, that truth is something we can use to access through reason, but also through revelation. So we talk about the Bible as God's word being true, telling us truth about God and creation and who we are as human beings and how we might be redeemed. Then we take that biblical worldview and we, from that standpoint, begin to examine counterfeit worldviews, Marxism, postmodernism, secularism, mm -hmm. and so forth, that all have a, an origin story, an expl explanation of human brokenness, and a form of salvation, quote unquote. They all have prophets, they all have priests, they all have religious books. I teach about those as counterfeit worldviews, so I help the students grasp what they are so that they're not caught off guard when they run into those things, especially in their college classes. And then the third thing is we teach them how to dialogue, how to ask questions, mm -hmm. how to walk with other people. The goal is not to do this, to butt heads with other people. The goal is to realize we are side by side, moving together toward truth. I think that's more of Jesus' ideal. Going forward, do you ever see a day where cancel culture will either be minimized or just go away completely? Do you see that, or is, are we in this for the long haul here? Um, it's a little distressing to me that the vast majority of people are afraid of being canceled. The vast majority of people think that canceling is a bad idea. The vast majority of people think that people ought to be able to express what they have to say freely. And yet cancellation is still taking place. The nastiness is still there. I have a friend um, who tragically ended his own life mm. after he was... people. He was a professor at a college, and 40,000 people who didn't even know him signed a petition and had all of this stuff just to get him fired. He spiraled into a depression mm -hmm. and ended his own life. Now, all of those people, all of the charges against him have now been proven to be untrue. All of the Facebook pages that were made against him have all now been deleted. But he's gone forever. He's gone. Uh, I, uh, it distresses me to realize that words are still that powerful if we don't somehow recover the realization that forgiveness and restoration are still possible there will be no end mm. to the cancel culture yeah good stuff good stuff um can't let you go today we mentioned at the top of the uh, our conversation that you are a podcaster and your podcast is called the dr jeff show the dr jeff uh, show podcast. What, what can people expect to hear when they download an episode or listen to an episode somewhere online well this is the show where i interview major thought leaders mm -hmm. to show how worldview changes everything so i interview media personalities interview celebrities musicians uh, other kinds of artists philosophers, theologians, wide, all, gamut, wide, yeah. wide range. range of people, yeah. all on that theme that your worldview changes, it changes everything. So that's the focus of the, the that's show. Great. That's great. And it's long form. Most of our episodes are 30 to 45 minutes. So I give people time to really say what they think. Yeah. So this isn't just a, a, a podcast show, a uh, podcast show, a soundbite show. Not Where you encapsulate bites. everything in, in five fact, to I 10 minutes. You tell my guests. Don't give me the soundbite answer, mm -hmm. because if you do, I'm going to ask you to expand on it. I want you to go ahead and feel free yeah. to say what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, 
I like to do this on my podcast a little bit. It's kind of a quick popcorn question thing. <laughs> Want to throw a couple things by you just to see what you what you have to say, what you've been up to. So here we go. If you don't mind, we don't have to if you don't want. <laughs> I don't. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Best book you've read recently? Mm. Live Not By Lies by Rod Dreher. Okay. Why do you like that book? I loved the fact that he went throughout Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and interviewed people who had been persecuted because of their faith. And he went back to Alexander Solzhenitsyn's point that the very first thing we must do to stand for the truth is to stop living as if lies are okay. Okay. What music do you have on constant replay right now? What's a band or a singer or something that you're like, I love this, this is wonderful? I only listen to music when I'm exercising. Okay. Probably Skillet. Or awesome. classic rock. But pyrotechnics, mostly. fire, explosions. It's the best music ever. I'm a big fan too. That's <laughs> great. That's great. Uh, final one. Any movies that you've seen recently that you would recommend to our audience here? Mm. I, I took my son. We, we see all the Marvel movies. Yes. I th we unpacked a lot of what happened in the most recent Spider-Man Spider -Man. movie. You that are, was really that was really inter interesting conversion of all a bunch of different aspects of the Marvel Marvel universe, which my sons understand and I only understand secondarily. That movie has come up several times when I've asked these questions in the last month or two. So that's that's fascinating to me that that movie kind of stands out for a lot of people. I saw it too. I enjoyed it. It was good. And there's a great youth pastor joke in it. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for the time today. And once again, folks, listen to Jeff's podcast, The Dr. Jeff Show. It's available wherever you can find podcasts. Thanks, thanks Jeff. Chris.